My earliest musical memories happened when I was about the age of three, when I used to improvise. I've always been a good improviser, and I used to improvise on the piano. And I used to have a captive audience in my maternal grandfather because he used to clap at the end of my representations of lightning, thunder, rain, and all the rest of it. Also, when my mother was giving birth to my brother, I remember, or well, my nanny tells me, that I played quite obsessively a 78 recording of um, the Huddersfield Boys' Choir singing Nymphs and Shepherds and from Humberdinck's Hansel and Gretel, Brother, Come and Dance With Me. I think music was then, for me, the great solace. When I was three, I used to think that the thunder was the sound of God's anger. So in a way, I never stopped believing in God. It was something that never entered my mind. As Inrahat Khan has written, music is none other than the sound of the beloved. And although at the age of three, I had no idea about Inrahat Khan or Indian Sufis, I think it was true for me at the age of three, as it's been all through my life. I used to listen to Handel in the form of Solomon, also in the form of uh, Solomon arranged by Sir Thomas Beecham, because I had the 78 records of this. At a later stage, I listened to Bach, because my father took me to concerts of the St. Matthew Passion, and I used to hear people like Kathleen Ferrier singing the contralto parts, with Peter Pierce singing the Evangelist. And I also was taken to concerts of Indian music from a very young age by my mother. I composed the Dunn sonnets while I was still at school. They were something that seemed to come out of me. The music was first performed at a concert given by the London Bach Society with Paul Steinitz conducting. And it was the first time that I'd really heard a piece of music played professionally of mine. And it had an extraordinary effect on me. And I remember a composer coming up to me afterwards. I don't know whether it was Anthony Milner or Nicholas Moore, because both those composers were present and said, did I always write such dark music? I can see that the music is metaphysically dark, but another story relating to the Dunn sonnets was that Madame Ampanoff, who was then the head of Boozy and Hawks, showed the score to Igor Stravinsky, and I was taken at a later date to meet Stravinsky when he came to the Royal Academy of Music. And I remember I was introduced to him, and he gave me the score back, and all he'd written on it was, I know, I don't know what he knew. My father's business, which was a very expensive builder's, uh, did work for the Beatles. At that time, I must say, I enjoyed listening to the Beatles. I've never enjoyed greatly pop music, but I was introduced to Yoko Ono and John Lennon in a dinner party in Knightsbridge. And I remember that they uh, arrived in a great white Rolls Royce and they brought their own macrobiotic food, and we never sat at table in the end. We sat on the floor and played each other tapes and ate macrobiotic food. After that, I think it was Ringo Starr, after John Lennon had emigrated to America, took over the project, and finally it was recorded by Apple Label, yes. The Whale was a piece written by an angry young man. What was I angry about? I was angry because the world didn't see the cosmos as in metaphysical terms. I was also angry because what I saw of so-called classical music in those days was very po-faced, either coming out of Manchester, or the so-called Manchester School, or coming out of Darmstadt in Germany. I didn't like the po-faced serialism. I didn't like the abstraction. And I wrote The Whale as a reaction, in a way. The piece is very fantastical. 
I was influenced by the kind of films that were being made in the 60s. And I think I owe quite a lot to those particular films in the way that I conceive the whale, uh, because it was a fantastical story. One could say that at this period in my life, or almost all periods of my life, that death, in a sense, has been a kind of muse. By a muse, I mean something or someone that brings forth knowledge of God. One takes the example of Dante and Beatrice, or one takes the example of the great Sufi mystic Ibn Arabi and Nizam. This is traditionally what a muse is, but death can also act as a muse because the death of someone close to one has often, in my case, brought forth music. The Latin word amor, which means love, contains mors in it, in the second part of the word, amor. And I think death and love are connected, and it's not surprising, therefore, that death and love act as muses. Any epiphany, whether it be a person, whether it be an event in life, can bring forth God. And for me, if God is brought forth, then that brings forth music, because as I said before, Inrat Khan says, the sound of music is none other than the beloved. And there is only one beloved, and that beloved is God. Modernism cannot envisage any kind of source. Modernism, in my experience of it, and it isn't something that I have turned my back on totally, I listen to the music of modern composers, I listen to the music of young composers, but I've never found, as yet, anything within modernism that has brought forth God. I've never found anything within it that I'm able to interiorize. And if you cannot interiorize a sound, then clearly the music has no spiritual possibility. One could take one exception. One thinks of the music, I think of the music of Weben, for instance, as miraculous and as a true epiphany. He was a mystic, a, a nature mystic. His early music is wonderful because one's no idea where it comes from. And then the late serial music, the two cantatas, the late piano variations. This music can be internalized because it's so transparent. I had a wonderful teacher in someone called David Lumsden who introduced me to modernist techniques and modernist ways of doing things and took me to modernist concerts. And I'm very grateful that he did so. The fact he said that I would probably reject 93% of them. I think I basically reject 99%.